Right there, geezers, Jules here from FGS, home of the future game show. And you know what? AI is becoming a very prevalent part of our lives. It's in our schools, it's in our workplaces, hell, it's even in this very web camera right now. Look at this, using dynamic zoom, using just my fingers. Creepy, right? Also quite fun. Whoa! Go back to normal. Go back to normal. Yet here's the thing, I'm not actually worried about these devices taking over the world, especially if the video games that we're covering today are anything to go by, because let's just say the AI involved in these games kinda sucks. It's quite fun this, isn't it? <laughs> making, probably making you feel a bit sick there. Let's stop this, let's stop now, stop. stop. Yes, what we're talking about today is less AI and more A. <laughs> what are you doing over there, buddy? Walking aimlessly into a wall? Cool, don't mind me. But you know what? I've got barely two brain cells to rub together, so I had an idea, a spark of intelligence, and that was to get Nathan, fellow FGS commentator and also amazing colleague, and bring him into this list as well. So today, we're both going to be looking at eight video games with the worst AI. Hey, my name's Nathan, this is the Future Game Show, and I'm here with Jules talking all about bad video game AI, a video we're both likely going to regret making when the robots take over, and we're taken to trial by all these games and cross-examined by Alexa for crimes against computers. But hey-ho, there's no turning back now, so... Let's get on with it. And you know the draw by now, this is the deep cut with Jules Gill, a baby, so that means that there's going to be games you haven't heard about, need to know more about, or games that you haven't thought about in a long old while. But with that in mind, let's get on with the list, shall we? Before my webcam decides to take over this show for itself, I'm watching you. Long story short, don't expect to see things like Big Rigs Over the Road Racing or Die Katana, because that game, <laughs> that game's stinky. But anyway, let's talk about Tenchu. Oh yeah. Ah, Tenchu, a video game series as close to my heart as the blade the ninja behind me has just impaled me with. Alright buddy, I'm dead now. Now you see, when I was but a wee bold babby, I grew up with this blockily animated and schlockily acted stealth game, and let me tell you friends, thanks to its balls hard missions, sometimes finicky controls, and low low draw distance, this is a title that truly is the definition of a Marmite game. For those of you not in the know as to what Marmite's here, we Brits use Marmite as uh, both kind of like an edible tar, we put it on our breakfast sandwiches in the morning, our crumpets as it were, but also we use it to like patch the foundations, like cracks in our houses and stuff like that. It's very versatile. It's kind of like Vegemite, but good. Now, the Australians, job accomplished. Uh, anyway, whether you love it or hate it, I absolutely loved it. But maybe I loved it for a different reason, for you see one of my favourite things to do in the original Ten Two was abuse the hell out of enemy AI through use of pools of water. You see, while you, a lithe and sexy ninja, can swim in bodies of water, the enemies can't. But unfortunately, they seem to have missed this memo and will routinely follow you into the pools looking for a scrap only to go belly up moments later. This means that you can just chill there on your floaty and just watch as the guards go, Oi, you! You shouldn't be here! And you go like, oh, come get me there, mate. And they walk in, they wade in, and they go, drinking a lethal amount of water. And then the rest of their guard mates just go like, Oh, you! Come here! Rinse and repeat. Quite literally. But it gets better, as when an enemy dies in this way, their body disappears, meaning that other guards will just walk around on by now, just worrying amounts of corpses that are really clogging up their lord's koi pond. Maybe these troops are not destined for promotion. The Elder Scrolls Oblivion. You know, there's a number of things you can be sure of when you purchase a Bethesda game. One, you're going to lose roughly 624 hours of your life. Two, Todd Howard now somehow legally owns your firstborn child. And three, you're about to experience the jankiest jank that has ever janked. To be honest, this entry could have been any Bethesda game, but it feels like the, the infamous trademark Bethesda NPC was born in 2006 with the release of Oblivion. You know, I can only assume that the rudimentary behaviour of these characters in Bethesda games is just how Todd Howard views us, the human race, from his immortal pedestal upon which he dreams of nothing but Indiana Jones games. Or, and this is an alternative theory, maybe the actors they hire to play the NPCs just walk and talk and look like that. Hmm. Much to ponder. There is nothing like the AI in Oblivion. There's nothing like having a friendly chat with a guard that then, for reasons unknown to the rational mind, descends into incandescent rage and instant violence. Or having a friendly conversation with a lizard in a pub, cycling through their dialogue options and watching the facial animations have what can only be described as a medical emergency. 
But I'm fascinated by it because would we enjoy Oblivion as much if the AI wasn't as unique as this? I don't know. I mean, it's a great argument for art being the sum of all its pieces, the good, the bad, and the jank. And actually, this questionable artificial intelligence is now as fondly remembered as the more positive aspects of our travels throughout Tamriel. So I don't know. Maybe Oblivion just wouldn't be as good if the AI wasn't this unique. At this juncture, though, can we please just take a minute to play the greatest clip of all time? Can we do that? Yeah, take it. Okay, roll, roll VT. Farewell. May you rest in peace. That is the funniest thing of all time, and I can rightfully say that because my granddad actually created comedy back in 1942. But there's also a level to this rudimentary AI that then encourages the player to do ingenious things. I mean, take a look at Skyrim. When players realised that an NPC's ability to realise that you were stealing items was tied directly to their vision cones, they simply placed a bucket over the head of NPCs, thus blocking that vision cone entirely. So cue entire public areas in which every NPC has been bucket-headed to allow the player to rob the town blind. Just... Ingenious. If only things like that were possible in real life, Ocean's Eleven would have been a much simpler film. Okay then, let's talk about Extreme Paint Brawl. 1998. Hey kids, are you ready to go to the extreme? Jules, yeah. be careful, you're reaching yeah. a max level yeah. of extreme. Push the engines, Mark, take us to the extreme. Oh, sorry about that, Mark. Uh, let's reset things. Right, back in action. Let's try and keep things calm. And trust me, there's nothing more calm than the AI of Deep Cut Extreme Paint Brawl 1998. And that is because the brains of your teammates and enemies are a barren wasteland of pure nothingness. Oh, it's so serene and eerie. Ser Sereery. That's a terrible portmanteau, it works better on paper. But you know what, there is actually another portmanteau that explains the AI state in this game. Uh, but both words are- <coughs> I say this because if you're playing on an indoors map, your team won't even recognise doors and get stuck in areas running full tilt into a wall. If you take them outside to roam free, they'll develop a severe case of agoraphobia and start glitching out as they try to crouch, lay down or just cower from the sky above them. And making this even more strange is the fact that they still somehow retain perfect accuracy, meaning that despite looking like they're doing an interpretive dance titled Fear in all its forms and also I need the toilet, they can snipe you like Widowmaker the moment you expose a sultry blocky thigh, or dare I suggest an ankle. Oh, gasp, Mr. Darcy. Truly this makes it one of the worst examples of AI because it is overwhelmingly incompetent and yet under the right circumstances overpowered. No, on both accounts. Dead Rising. I love the bones of the original Dead Rising, the zombie epic that so perfectly recreated our George A. Romero Dawn of the Dead fantasies that they literally had to print on the box, that it had nothing to do with George A. Romero and feels only a step away from printing his phone number and asking you to personally call him up and apologise every time you want a shot of this game. Hey, George. Yeah, me again. Yeah, I, I'm going for my fifth playthrough of Dead Rising and I just wanted to let you know that I am once again sure that you had nothing to do with this video game. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. Yeah, while I've got you, what is the afterlife like? I've always wondered if it's a... Hung up again. To this day, I still think Dead Rising is one of the tightest, most responsive games around. The level of detail is unparalleled and every playthrough offers a unique experience unlike the last, but the AI me. It's awful. Survivors get stuck on geometry, they take weird routes around obstacles and they just they get overwhelmed so easily. And they demonstrate the cardinal sin of AI in gaming in which giving a survivor a weapon makes them more vulnerable to enemies. As if they feel it would be nothing but rude not to stop and try their best to eradicate the entire zombie infestation with nothing but the frying pan you've put in their hands. Better instead just to leave them unarmed and mash that shout button like an abusive parent. Get, get back here now! Get right here now! Stop what you're doing and get come right here now! How dare you? How dare you? You know, I'm really starting to understand my upbringing a bit more now. Hmm. 
Combine this with the fact that the original save system only allowed you one slot in which to save your progress. The unpredictability of the AI made it certain that you would be repeating parts of this game again and again and again, hoping for the moment in which the awful AI stars align and somehow your companions are able to overcome their simplistic programming and make it back to your base in one piece. Before you then get the message that you forgot about a survivor right back at the start because they forgot how stairs work. Follow me! Follow me! Follow me! Ah! Anyway, let's talk about Rise of the Robots. Okay, my friends, it's time to enter Jules's theater of the mind. Welcome, welcome, tickets, please. Ooh, what is that? Clean up after yourself. That is not what the theater is for. Anyway, take your seats, ladies and gentlemen, as we talk about... A little thing called AI. Okay, so imagine the scene. Sean from Hello Games walks into a room to be greeted by Peter Molyneux for another meeting of Overpromises Synonymous. But before they've poured a cup of tepid coffee, there's a commotion in the corridor as they move to see what's happening. And with that, Peter also promises that his new game will let you turn lead into actual gold. The door bursts open and in comes Rise of the Robots. It screams in Sean's face about how it was the first and the best at overpromising, before then breaking down and crying in the middle of the room about how the world had never ever seen anything like its AI programming. End scene, end scene, thank you very much, thank you very much for coming. It was spicy, it was poignant, and no, there are no refunds. This, my friends, is the tragic tale of Rise of the Robots, one of the first instances of a game running its mouth whilst also getting fat on fake hype. And boy howdy was it a doozy. You see, for some reason the developers touted that this fighting game would feature AI that would learn players' moves and grow to respond to them, in turn making this a title that would learn to defeat you and provide a true challenge. Of course, this captured the attention of pretty much everyone in the room, but this is the problem. When you've got eyes on you, they start to notice little things like how your so touted mechanics that you've got right here really actually boil down to you being able to beat every single opponent by kicking his <laughs> shins in, because apparently that was the one attack that the AI couldn't learn to stop. Oh, what's this? A low crouched kick? A low crouched kick? Hmm, I probably should learn to, to block this. Hmm, hmm. Oh, I'm dead. Oh, didn't have a chance. Piece of <laughs> Upon release, this game was mauled for its atrocious AI, which couldn't even be trusted to pull its own life support plug, let alone give players a challenge. And in fact, the only way that this did provide a challenge is in the same way that pulling a lever that feeds all your enemies into a grinder is a challenge of your arm strength. This, coupled with the game running at a pace that made erosion look speedy and graphics so sharp you could cut beef on them, meant that this rise of the robots was a significant fall from lofty promises. Hitman, blood money. Now, I need to put a disclaimer right at the top of this entry. It is one of those flip reverse ones because the AI in Hitman Blood Money is not bad. It's just big boned. I mean, just unique. See, the funny thing with the AI in games really is that, is that what players want is for it to be predictable. They want to know that if they perform a certain action that the AI will respond in a way that they can anticipate. Like, you know, if you bang on a wall in the original Metal Gear Solid, you'll hear. What was that noise? Oh, Jesus, sorry. That was my mistake. I better go. Back in a minute. Whose footprints are these? But with Hitman Blood Money, the artificial intelligence in question can't help but be queried when upon learning of his wife's immolation, the mob boss of a new life simply returns to watching TV. No one even tells the clown to take the day off. After roughly two minutes of panic, it's very much business as usual. But ultimately in games like this, the artificial intelligence needs to be simple. Things do need to reset back to baseline and everything needs to return to normal. Because if the AI did act appropriately here, everybody would run away. There would be no men to hit. The game would have to be called Man No Money. And I'm not playing that. Right, let's talk about Resident Evil Outbreak File 2. Okay, so when it comes to terrible AI and the Resident Evil games, your mind will likely go to your AI partner from Resident Evil 5. And while it was most certainly a very infuriating thing to see Sheva or Chris, people do seem to forget that it was both characters that were affected, picking up and using items that you desperately needed, it is far from the worst. As today, we're turning to a deep cut corner of a Capcom cornerstone, and that is Resident Evil Outbreak File 2, or as it was known in my friendship group, the one with 
with the elephant zombies. Yet this isn't the only massive rotter of the bunch because the AI in this game ranges from being annoying to insufferable thanks to its takes on item management and its inability to not stop shooting enemies even when they are very, very dead. Because you know certain enemies have death animations where they fall to their knees or they fall on their back and they wriggle about for a bit. Well, the AI teammate sees this as just such a challenge to their authority that they are willing to start World War Four. I would say three, but come on, it's basically on our doorstep already. Depressing. Now I'm all for double tapping, but this is more like the tapping of the temple scene from Invincible because think, Mark, think, what are you doing? You're wasting all of our ammo on something that is already dead. And don't get me started about whether it was alive or undead, just stop shooting it. You're wasting both of our ammo. This will result in your AI teammates becoming useless as they click empty guns towards enemies and then panic and chew through all of your healing items the moment they get caught short. This turns what should be a deliriously silly jaunt into some of the weirder locales of Raccoon City into a babysitting mission in which you must protect a brain-dead AI teammate from the actual undead. Tell ya, it is hard to tell the difference between these two sometimes. They are both absolutely stupid. The Last Guardian. I love all of Team Ico's games. Ico is beautiful. Shadow of the Colossus is a masterpiece. And The Last Guardian is the weird baby of both of those games that people seem to take. Because when it came out, players raged about Trico's AI. They thought it was terrible. And, and was it terrible? No, the problem was, it was just too realistic. You see, Team Ico were keen that Trico felt like a living animal, not like a video game AI that predictably did everything you asked when you asked it. Instead, they wanted it to feel like a real changeable creature that sometimes responded to your demands by simply saying, nah. So of course gamers cried that the game had awful AI because, you know, gamers feel like everything they say should be listened to. You know, like right now, you should be listening to me. Are you listening to me? Are you on your phone again? Put your phone down! You know, but I love the fact that Trico did their own thing. Wandering through levels, sometimes catching me if I fell, sometimes deciding they couldn't be arsed and letting me fall to a painful death. But look, shh, if I'm really, really honest, I can sympathise. Especially when I have to jump from one ledge to another to progress the game, a movement that can only be completed with Trico's help, and they simply don't want to do it. The current ledge? Sure. The previous ledge? Hey, why not? The ledge in front of us? Sorry, buddy. It's going to be a hard no. It's, uh, it's giving me bad vibes. And there we go, my friends. Those were eight video games with the worst AI. I hope that you enjoyed that and let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. Massive thank you to Nathan as well for stepping in and helping me out. And if you want to chat to me in the meantime, you can go over here to our social medias where you can follow myself, you can follow Nathan, and you can follow our lovely editor, Mark, as well. Do so at your own peril. And by that, I mean you can just chat to us when we're in between recording stuff. It's quite nice, actually. Just, just chuck us a follow. But before I go, my friend, hope you are treating yourself well. Even though we spoke today about brain-dead AI, there is one smart thing that everyone can do, and that is just being kind to themselves. Because you deserve love, you deserve happiness, you deserve success, my friend. We all do as human beings, and don't let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise. Go out there and smash your life goals, because I believe in you, and you need to believe in yourself as well. As always, I've been Jules, you have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.